go ahead and get started now. Um, welcome, everybody. My name is Carrie Sepkis, and I work with the Career Development Center, second floor of the Student Union Building. How many of you have been up there? Yeah. Just a few. Well, I encourage you all to come. We have great um, resources for internships and all sorts of help on uh, exploring career paths. And then when you get down to the job search, uh, creating resumes and writing cover letters, we can help you with that. So please come visit us. Um, we're very excited today to have a wonderful present presenter, uh, Daniel Ichinaga, who's come to um, talk with us about his career in law. But before we get started, I wanted to, um, some of you may already know Taylor, but um, it sounds like that he's going to be starting up a new student group for free law. Yeah, so uh, myself and Laura Haynes, and if you know her, are starting a free law club here at SBU. Uh, it's main focus, it's hopefully to host more events such as these um, and focus on law school admissions, prepping for the LSAT, group study sessions, all sorts of things like that. So if that's something that you're interested in, I have a sign-up sheet. Um, we're in the process of getting formalized, so hopefully we'll have our first meeting this coming spring quarter, and elections for any sorts of positions. So there's all sorts of great opportunities for that. Resume builder, put that on your application for law school. So if that's something that interests you, feel free to sign up. Yeah, sure. And I can put my email on the board if you have any questions about me or what I'm doing the law club. So. Um, so now I wanted to introduce our speaker today, um, Daniel Ichinaga, um, an alum of SPU, class of 1980, uh, graduated. What was your major? Uh, it was double major, poli sci and business. Well, poli sci and business. Um, and then uh, summa cum laude. Right. Summa cum laude. Oh, right. Yeah, so um, fellow alum here to speak with you today. Um, and Daniel um, got his uh, legal degree from UC Davis in 1983 and has been practicing now for a while with, the, uh, with Ellis Lee and Wicked Street. Um, and that's in downtown Seattle, right? Um, and comes with all sorts of amazing experiences. He, his areas of practice are Huge. I mean, I'm amazed. Uh, business transactions, mergers and acquisitions, employment, nonprofit governance and taxations, private education, securities, um, <laughs> quite a bit. Uh, and so he's going to talk more about that. And then also wanted to mention that um, he's been selected super lawyer by his peers um, for every year since 2001. By, um, yeah, so that's um, pretty impressive as well. And then he um, has uh, he served as managing partner of the firm for a couple of years, right? And then um, has also served as a member of the Seattle Ethics and Elections Commission from 1995 to 2000. And um, he also serves as the president and is a member on the board of directors of the Seattle Kendo Kai, um, which I suppose you can tell us more about sure. that, but that's um, very interesting background as well. And then is a playwright. Um, at the same time, so I don't know how you managed to find all the time for this, but uh, we're interested in hearing from you, um, just you know, about your career path. And so please Great. come on up. And Thanks. 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 Uh, good afternoon. It's always nice coming back and uh, seeing the university, and uh, I have a lot of fond memories <coughs> of of being here, and a lot of the struggles of figuring out what I wanted to do. Um, uh, a lot of that occurred here at Seattle Pacific and talking among friends and faculty members and so forth. So it's, uh, it's a great environment. I hope you're enjoying it and that you take advantage of the resources that you have here and just figuring out what you want to do for the rest of your life. So I, I wanted to tell you a little bit about how I came to the law, uh, my time here at the university, my time at law school, and then, and then legal practice since then. So in early high school, and not everyone makes these decisions this, this early, but in early high school, I started thinking about, well, what, what would I want to do, and what were my strengths, and what, what did I think were those things that might um, work well in a career? And I enjoyed math, enjoyed history, enjoyed English and enjoy, uh, enjoyed the problem-solving aspects of, 
of math. And my dad knew a, um, a guy who was an assistant uh, district attorney for Contra Costa County. He was in charge of the fraud unit back then. And he let me uh, sit in on one of his meetings. So he's sitting around there, and this is before casual work days. They're all in jeans and, and short sleeve shirts and having this brainstorming session, trying to figure out what to do with this uh, nursing home situation. The, the, uh, the clients weren't being well cared for, the medications were being diluted, uh, the, the facilities weren't being properly cleaned. So they, they clearly had an action against this nursing home. But they were struggling with how do we deal with the people that are there, the, the people that are, are the, the residents of this facility. And it was at that moment that it occurred to me that the, that the profession of law, that lawyers were engaged in a helping profession. It was really about uh, people, helping people in tough situations. And that's what sent me down the road into this, this uh, career of law. I didn't know any other lawyers. I didn't know what it was like. And, um, I didn't know exactly how to get there either. So I tried to do a number of things, and I'm, I'm sure it's all the things that, that you're focusing on, getting good grades, um, having certain extracurricular activities, and so forth. So when I was here, I was an RA, um, a student body president, and um, studied hard, did all the things that you'd expect people to do. The thing that I Looking back on the thing that I wish I had focused a bit more on were those classes that required me to read good literature, good writing, and also those courses that required me to write. So history classes, English classes, if, you can t if there's Shakespeare courses here, Jane Austen courses, George Eliot, I'd focus on those because the the, the clarity in writing helps develop clarity in thinking. And clarity in thinking and clarity in expression are what we need as lawyers. So if you can focus on those things, that's what I would do to prepare yourself um, to develop, begin developing those skills that I think will serve you well as lawyers. So, then I <clears throat> was admitted to um, law school and didn't know very much about law school either. So the, they have a week-long orientation session where they tell you what to expect in law school. And one of the first things the, one of the instructors did is they, they uh, I think they wanted to focus our attention. They said, they said there are seven days Seven days in a week, 24 hours in a day. So you've got a total of 148 hours. So if you give yourself eight hours of sleep, that's 56. And you got 92 hours left. And that first year we had um, uh, 16 semester hours. That brought down to 76. And then they said, you should have four hours of class study for every hour of in-class in class lecture. So that's 64 hours. And then they said, you know, let's say you spend 30 minutes per meal or showering or whatever else you want to do. So that's another 1.5 per day times 7. 10.5. So at the end of the at the end of the analysis, we had 1.5 hours per day or 1.5 hours per week that were free time, some sort. So it didn't quite work out to be like that. But that first year, there's this panic that sets in and you're reading cases and you're trying to analyze them and they want 
all the cases to be analyzed in a particular way. So you read through the case and you outline the relevant facts. And then you identify the issues. You identify the holding of the case. And then you identify the rationale of the case. And that takes a while to do. Then you get to class. And the professor calls on you and asks you the basic questions about the case. And then the, <clears throat> the purpose of law school is to teach you how to move from specific fact situations and specific cases to general principles. And then to use, develop those general principles and apply them to other specific cases. So that's when the Socratic method comes into play. And I don't know if you've seen the movies Paper Chase or the first year. There's, some, there's a couple of other movies out there where they use the Socratic method. So that's sort of your law school experience. First year is a panic. <clears throat> Second year is you're just trying to keep up the classwork. And the third year, you're ready to, you're ready to graduate. I, I didn't find the, I didn't find law school to be one of the most interesting times of my life. It's something, it's a, it's a means to an end. There, you do develop a certain kind of thinking in law school. But if you're looking at law school as a way to fill out your resume or you think it's going to look good to have a JD after your name, I'd strongly recommend that you reconsider spending three years of your life that way. I'd, real, I'd only go to law school if I knew that I wanted to practice law. So, and <clears throat> let me then tell you what I, what I think about the practice of law. Because this is what gets me, this is what gets me really excited. There are times when I look around the world and I see those countries that live without the rule of law. And it, it's those times that get me excited about living in the country that we live in and having the kind of legal system that we, that we have. The rule of law means something. Uh, I don't know how many of you have read David McCullough's book on John Adams, but it talks about the Boston Massacre in uh, March of 1770. There were a number of soldiers that were on duty, British soldiers, and they fired into this crowd of civilians and killed five people. <clears throat> and they, they put these soldiers on trial uh, for murder charges. And John Adams and two others were called upon to defend these soldiers. And it was very important to Adams that they receive a fair trial. I think in his mind, the hallmark of a legitimate nation is a, is a nation that has the rule of law. So they went on trial. And he's, he's trying this in, in the colonies where the British soldiers have just massacred a number of civilians. And he achieved, I uh, believe it was five acquittals, and there were two convictions for murder. He brought up this loophole in British common law that said if the person could read, they, you would reduce the, the charge from murder to manslaughter. So these, there were two, the two individuals that were convicted of murder had their charges reduced to manslaughter. But the message he wanted to send to the British was that they were a grown-up nation, that the colonies were a grown-up nation, that we had the rule of law, that justice prevailed. And um, to me, that's just very exciting. That's, if you come to the practice of law, that's the legacy that you're joining. That's the, the stream of people in the history that, that you join. The other thing I wanted to read from, it touches on this, is uh, A Man for All Seasons. And they've got a movie out there that's great. It's a play by Robert Bolt. And um, there's a line here where Richard Moore, at this point, he's the chancellor. He's, the, in essence, the attorney general for King Henry the, the uh, Eighth. King Henry wants everyone to agree that he's allowed to divorce his, the current queen. And Sir Thomas More refuses to 
sign on to, to, to that law. Um, and so the play culminates in his, uh, his execution. But there are a lot of great lines before he dies. Um, in this one case, they know that this individual, Richard Rich, is probably a, a, going to be a spy against him. And so his family tells them that, they sh that he should arrest this individual, Richard Rich. So his son-in-law says, um, oh, his daughter says, uh, arrest him. Father, he's a bad man. And Moore says, there's no law against that. And Roper, his son-in-law, says, there is. There's God's law. And then Roper says, or uh, Moore says, then God can arrest him. Uh, and then they uh, go back and forth a couple times and talk about how um, you, you're setting man's laws above God's laws. And Moore says, no, far below. But let me draw your attention to a fact. I am not God. The currents and eddies of right and wrong, which you find such plain sailing, I can't navigate. I'm no voyager, but in the thickets of the law, oh, there, I'm a forester. I doubt there's a man alive who could follow me there, thank God. Then he talks, then um, Moore says, he should go, Rich should go. He should be allowed to escape. If he were the devil himself, until he broke the law. And then his son-in-law says, so, so you'd give the devil the benefit of the law? And he says, yes. Um, yes. What would you do? Cut a great road through the law to go after the devil? And his son-in-law says, yes, I'd cut down every law in England to do that. And Moore answers, oh. And when the last law was down and the devil himself turned around, where would you hide, Roper, all the laws being flat? This country's planted thick with laws from coast to coast, man's laws, not God's. And if you cut them down, then, and you're just the man to do it, do you really think you could stand upright in the winds that would blow then? Yes. I'd give the devil the benefit of the law for my own safety's sake. There's this concept of the, of the law being there to protect us. And when I look at the law, I divide it up into two buckets. The law sets forth the minimum standard of conduct. So you have criminal law uh, against murder, theft, kidnapping. And for that, there are uh, either fines or imprisonment. So there's the criminal law. There's also civil law in the area of torts that, that protects us against uh, the negligence of others. So society expects us to engage in life in a reasonable, in a reasonably careful manner. And if we aren't reasonably careful and we injure others, then we owe compensation to the injured parties. So in those two areas of law, you have the enforcers and you have defenders. And, and both are necessary. There are many <clears throat> that sometimes ask, well, how, how can you ever defend a guilty person? And um, Sam, uh, Senator Sam Irwin, a um, senator from North Carolina, uh, he's famous because of the Watergate hearings. He said one time, when, I, when the Lord Jesus Christ appears with me on the judgment day, he will be defending a very guilty client indeed. There are times when even the guilty require representation. And that's to put a check on the, the forces of the government to make sure that the enforcement of the laws are just. The other bucket, <clears throat> the other group, um, or the other category I'd use for the law is the bucket that I'd call our contractual relationships, our, the, the voluntary relationships that we form with one another. And those relationships are formed through a, a series of promises, mostly through contracts. 
So someone makes a promise to pay a certain amount to have their house painted. Someone agrees to work uh, for $25 an hour um, in, in exchange for filing or whatever the, whatever the employment relationship might be. People enter into contracts to sell their business or to um, hire, hire people to distribute goods or to create goods. So the law gives us a framework for developing these voluntary relationships with one another. And the lawyers in those cases are also advocates for their client. They identify the uh, areas of risk and they advise their client on how to alloc allocate those risks. So if you take on more risk, then you usually want more compensation. If you take on less risk, then you're generally willing to take less compensation. I've, also, <clears throat> I've often thought through the years, what, what are those things that I, I think are useful to becoming a lawyer? And the, there are so many different kinds of people out there who practice law, so there are no general rules. This is, this is my list. Um, there are other people that uh, that may not have the attributes that I list here that, that have done very well in the law. But the, the list that I come up with is this. I think it's very important to have and nurture intellectual curiosity. You have to be curious about the state of the world. You have to be curious about what the law requires and to not just be satisfied with having a vague idea about what the law requires, but but have a desire to figure out exactly what the law requires because oftentimes it's in those details that you that you win or lose a case for your client or that you win or gain a point for your client in negotiations. Attention to detail is also very important. It's the, um, again, it's the details that can help you or hurt you in the end. I think there also needs to be an appreciation of solitude. There's a great amount of my work, there's a great amount of um, my work when I'm alone. I'm alone reading, I'm alone writing, I'm alone thinking. And there's certainly collaboration and times when I talk to uh, fellow attorneys in the office, or I talk to clients, or I talk to opposing attorneys, but most of the time I'm, I'm alone. If you can't be alone, you may want to consider another, consider another profession because there's a great deal of time that you spend alone in preparation. At the same time, uh, you can't be a monk. You have to have the ability to work together with others. You have to enjoy, I think, working with others. You have to have a certain amount of empathy for your client. You have to have a certain amount of empathy for your opponent to understand their perspective and their arguments, their weaknesses, their strengths. There's also a great benefit in um, or great need to be self-motivated and self-disciplined. There are certain <clears throat> court-imposed or client-imposed deadlines. You, know, you need a deal done by a certain time, or you have to file a court paper by a certain time. But other than that, lawyers have to juggle a number of cases and assignments at the same time. And usually, you don't have someone directing you in doing that. You have to be able to figure out the priorities. You have to be able to work those through those priorities because if you're, caught, uh, if you're caught short in terms of time, it's your client that suffers. We're, um, we're a profession that involves warring for others. We're a profession that takes on the burdens of others. And the burden, the things that are at risk are usually either life, in the case of criminal law, liberty in the case of criminal law, or treasure of some sort. 
time, money, assets. <clears throat> so when you make a mistake, what's at risk is not only potentially your license to practice law, but perhaps more importantly, what's at risk is whatever is at risk for your client, whatever is in dispute. So the stakes are high and lawyers need to, to, to motivate themselves and to impose upon themselves the discipline they need to accomplish the tasks. Um, finally, I think it's very important <clears throat> that you, you have within you a desire to improve and grow as a person, as a writer, as a listener, as an advocate, and as a student of human nature. You, the lawyer is called upon to exercise judgment and to make assessments based on oftentimes inadequate facts or incomplete facts. And um, through the practice of law, you build up this store of knowledge and you also build up this um, store of understanding about how we tend to react as people in certain situations. And that, that helps assess danger and helps evaluate um, solutions that we might propose for our clients. So, um, I hope that summary is not too uh, too daunting because it's it's a it's a very exciting profession. It's alive. It involves. Uh, it, it allows you to be involved in the lives of others. It, it allows you to be involved at those critical moments in people's lives. Either they're making a huge financial decision or their liberty or life is at stake. And uh, the, I, the one assumption I started with turned out to be very true. The practice of law is a helping profession. And I think it's very important to enter the profession understanding that because you'll lose sleep at nights, you'll worry because you care about the people that you're representing. And um, I think it's important to consider that, whether that's, it, it, is that something that resonates with you? And um, is that something that's going to excite you and get you out of bed each morning? So, any questions at this point? I didn't. I, I went straight through. Do you uh, feel like that was the right choice to make, or if you could do it again, would you take some time off? Um, that's a, it's a hard question to answer. I think for me, <clears throat> there are very few times, very few opportunities when you're ever going to have that chance to take off a chunk of time. And if you know that you're not going to lose your momentum, I'd take the time off. But if you have any question about <laughs> losing steam, losing focus, you may want to just plow through. There, there are advantages to waiting. People that were older that came to law school brought with them experience. They were able to see the law in a, in a different way. They, they, um, they brought experience to their practice, which is a good thing. Uh, for me, I think I wish I'd probably had taken some time off then. But um, I also know that I didn't feel a loss of momentum by continuing on, which I think was, in, which was also important for me to accomplish it. Another question here? Yeah. yeah. What type of law do you say you currently practice? Pardon me? What type of law do you currently practice? I currently practice in the area of business, uh, business law. So mergers and acquisitions, corporate law. Um, when, 
We, uh, when you represent small to mid-sized companies, we tend to cover, cover the waterfront. So they'll have questions about their leases, questions about in, um, their employees, um, how to hire them, how to fire them, what the risks are there. So it's a pretty wide range. Uh, in the past, I've done some litigation. The last trial was probably in 97 or so. So that, that's exciting work. It takes a lot of time, a lot of focus. You tend to have to focus on one thing at a time there in litigation. Um, the, uh, the up, there, there are some upsides and downsides there. Is you, with litigation, um, it's all consuming. Um, you, tend to, you tend to be around people at a time when they're in crisis and they're not very happy. And at the end of the day, uh, when litigation's over, no one usually tends to be very happy with the outcome. Um, on the business side of the transaction, usually everyone's pretty happy. Everyone's pretty hopeful. Everyone sees blue skies in the future. And at the end of the deal, there's usually uh, uh, dinner or some kind of celebration because people are looking forward to what's ahead of them, this new relationship they, that they've developed. Anybody else? Yeah. Have you ever considered pursuing uh, further education, for example, with your business? Would you ever consider doing an MBA or, or doing anything in addition to law school? Uh, no. I sort of have strong feelings about that one. There's, I know that there's some joint programs MBA, JD programs. I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't recommend a joint program. First of all, I think it takes longer, four years generally, right? And I don't think you have as complete a legal education or a business education. So if you're going to be a lawyer, you ought to go the pure JD route. If you want to be a business person, you probably want to spend time focusing on the MBA stuff. I mean, it, it sounds good and perhaps looks good, but I think in terms of spending your time, <clears throat> I'm, not, I'm not sure that a joint degree is worth it. In terms of further education, there, uh, there are people that go on to receive a master's in law in tax, and there's a couple of good programs. Uh, New York, Florida, uh, I think it's a one or two year program. So it's pretty intense full-time study after law school in, in tax. And if you want to be a tax attorney, that's great. And I think it's real it's a it's an excellent credential and a prepara good preparation. Anybody else? Yeah. Um, how many hours a week do you think you work? Like does it sort of consume your weekend hours as well? It's changed over the years, and, and it changes with, uh, with the, um, the workload. But when I first started practicing, I was with uh, a law firm called Preston Thorgrimson, Ellis, and Holman. Now they're, they're now KL Gates. And I think the average billable hours that they were looking at were 1,800 billable hours a year. So a billable hour is an hour that you can actually charge to somebody. And when I was working at Preston, I would usually work from about 8 to 6.30 or 7 or so, and then at least a half day on a Saturday to meet the 1,800 hours. And Folks in large New York firms are probably have billable hour, billable hour expectations of maybe 2,000 or 2,200, which is just insane. <coughs> Excuse me. I hope I didn't blast the microphone there. <coughs> right now, I uh, my billable hour expectation for myself personally is probably around 
1,500 hours or so, and I so I'm probably working 7:30 or 8 to about 6 or 6:30. I try not to work the weekends. I try not to work in the evenings. So, <clears throat> and at the current law for, format, we try to focus on living some sort of a balanced life. I read a, an article last year or so about <coughs> um, an increase in or a, uh, boutique firms that would allow you to almost pick and choose the hours that you would that you could work. And this was sort of, the article was sort of suggesting this might be a wave of the future. Is this, um, how prevalent or do, is this at all prevalent in the industry? Um, the article was geared more for, you know, women who wanted to cut back on their hours because of, you know, having a, a new child or whatnot. Is that is that really an option? And what, how how much room to maneuver is there, particularly for for ladies who uh, who want to, you know, have fewer hours, uh, fewer billable hours? Excuse me. Oh, I'm sorry. Well. <clears throat> Most of the most of the lawyers I know are full-time lawyers. There is a uh, a woman in our firm who has she has three three children. Thank you, <clears throat> and she's managed to try to carve out for herself the ability uh, the <clears throat> uh, limits on when she works. So she'll work Tuesday, Wednesday, Friday, in theory. But she's <clears throat> constantly on the computer at home. She's working weekends, uh, and it's a it's a difficult it's a difficult balance. <clears throat> it's difficult because the law is a the law is a jealous mistress. There, it will always want more from you in terms of time, and depending on the kind of person that you are. <clears throat> There's a certain amount of validation you have in working on a particular kind of case or a certain number of cases or things like that. So it's it it it's hard to it's hard to set a a, a boundary and a, and abide by it. I think now you can if it's more clerical or ministerial work. But if you're the lead attorney on the case, <clears throat> the needs of the case or the needs of the assignment really drive. The time that you have to devote to something. Um, there are people, though, that work hard to try to manage that, and um, there are law firms that are that are open open to that, open to more flexible hours, and so forth. But again, lawyers rarely punch a clock, and it the. Uh, the time that you spend on something is driven more by client desires or court-imposed deadlines than on than on a clock. So it it it's tough. Anybody else? Yeah. Uh, how do economic conditions affect the amount of work that is available? Wow. Well, we're sort of finding that out a little bit now. <laughs> The, um, it does slow up. <clears throat> I think it's slowing up now. There are uh, there were a lot of uh, securities offerings in the late 1990s before the dot com bu bubble. There were a number of uh, mergers and acquisitions that have uh, slowed up quite a bit now. So those attorneys that do transactional work. Um, are finding uh, finding business slower right now. Also, your clients tend to have less money to pay legal fees. Uh, there's a couple of folks I know that practice the bankruptcy law area, and they're doing they're doing well now. But it's, it's harder because they're able to help. There's less that they can do to help them out. They you tend to put them put people through uh, liquidation as opposed to reorganizing a business. So. Um, Real estate is down now. Um, crime can go up. Um, so it, 
the economy will affect different parts of uh, the, uh, the legal profession. Yeah. Yes. Um, in light of that question, how hard or easy is it, based on the economy, to get into a law firm? Because uh, do they close up looking for new lawyers like other professions close up looking for employment or? They, law firms will slow up on, um, on uh, hires. And there are, <clears throat> there are times in the past in Seattle where offers have been extended to first year law students and those offers have been withdrawn before the lawyers started their work. There's a number of firm also, firms also that have begun uh, layoffs of the lawyers and staff. Usually you, you don't lay off owners, but you would lay off the, the uh, junior lawyers and staff. So it can, it can be tough. I'm guessing that now we're, real, we're in, a, in a period of contraction. Anybody else? I have a question. Um, uh, um, what sort of experiences would you recommend for someone prior to law school? And then maybe you could also talk about what steps you take after, right after law school. Um, steps or things to do before law school that would that help with law school admission or just well, figure out <coughs> whether it'll... Mm-hmm. But, you know, hopefully at the same time, favorable for admissions committees. And I think it's, it, it helps to see what a law firm is like. And so if you can get a entry-level position in a law firm as a receptionist or a file clerk or something like that, that, that helps you understand a little bit about what you're getting into. Some ways. You see the personalities at a law firm, at least one law firm. That will help. Uh, there are also some I- internships you can have that you, you might be able to um, you might be able to get through um, uh, government agencies. So, attorney general's office, uh, prosecutor's office, public defender's offices. Uh, legal aid clinics; those are those provide opportunities also for uh, volunteer work, or some kind of exposure to the um, to the legal profession. Other than that, in terms of things that that might interest or catch the attention of an admissions committee, I think it's important. I think it's important to follow your passion on those things. Uh, I wouldn't do things just because you think it might look good on the resume. I think what you want to do, uh, I think what you want to do is find those things that you're passionate about. Find those things that you might be good at, that you enjoy doing. And that, that leads to success. And uh, those are the things that I think interest the law school admission committees. In terms of afterwards, Uh, that, that's a bit harder, I think, at that point. Uh, what did you do? Right after law school, I, um, well, the job search really begins in the first or second year, primarily the second year. So the first year, the summer after the first year of law school, uh, I got married and flipped hamburgers on uh, Old Silver Beach on Cape Cod which was great. Second year, I clerked for uh, Preston Thorgrimson uh, and got a summer position there and then they hired me right after law school. I, uh, I was able to get the job at Preston Thorgrimson because one of the uh, partners there, Bob Gunner, was also an SPU alum and taught a political science class on the Bill of Rights. I think it was during my sophomore year. 
So I took that class and we, we never got out, out of the, the, the First Amendment. It was supposed to be about the entire Bill of Rights, but <laughs> didn't get very far. Um, you know, other than that, I think it's, it's beginning to understand those things that might interest you during law school. So there were some people that knew they wanted to be uh, criminal prosecutors. There were others that knew they wanted to be public defenders. And um, so they found opportunities to, to pursue those positions. Uh, the rest of us were less clear about what we wanted to do after law school and looked for uh, jobs in uh, uh, either small or large law firms. I went to a large law firm and there were great advantages to doing that. Wonderful people, wonderful lawyers, um, but I suspected and found that I thrived in a smaller law firm setting. So some of those things that you might make decisions that take you down a particular road and then decide later in your career that, well, I really want to be somewhere else. I want to pursue something else. I, I don't want to spend my time putting criminals away. I want to help out a legal aid clinic or something like that. So I think those things, the understanding of what we want to do develops over, over time. But uh, initially, there'll be a round of interviews and job fairs and things like that. Anybody else? Yeah. What steps did you take to prepare for the LSAT? Let's see. I think um, I'm not sure. I think I got a test book and went through it a couple of times. I'm not sure. If I'm not sure there were preparation courses back then. Maybe there were. But um, what, what are folks recommending now? Are there preparation courses for the LSATs? Yeah, yeah it's probably not a bad, bad thing. It, it, I thought, though, from the questions, it, was, it seemed like it was going to be tough to prepare. There were, it was either stuff you're going to know or not know. But, yeah. Anybody else? Well, good luck, Thank and thanks for listening to me. Thank you. Thank you.